Okay. All right, so for those of you who are returning for reunions, welcome back. Uh, I also want to welcome back uh, our speaker um, for, I don't know what year we reunion this is for you, maybe an odd year, 29, wow, okay, welcome back. And welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Horseman Medal Forum, uh, sponsored by the Graduate School. My name is Andrew Campbell, and I'm the Dean of the Graduate School, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker, who is this year's medal recipient, Professor Sharona Gordon. Uh, the Horace Mann Medal is given annually to a Brown Graduate School alumnus or alumna who has made significant contributions in his or her field inside and outside of academia. Dr. Gordon received her PhD in physiology from Brown University in 1994, and throughout her career, her passion has been the study of, of the fine workings of ion channels that reside in the membranes of cells. She has published over 40 articles focused on many different aspects of ion channel structure and function, including her current NIH-funded research on the mechanism of activation and regulation of ion channels involved in the sensation of pain. <clears throat> Dr. Gordon has been recognized for her accomplishments in many ways. She recently was honored by inclusion in the Dana Alliance for Brain Initiatives, and she is the first woman editor in chief of the journal General Physiology, which is a premier journal for ion channel research. In addition, Dr. Gordon is a member of the faculty of 1,000, based on the notable significance of her work, and is a chair of the Board of Scientific Counselors for the National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute of the National Institutes of Health. She has extensive experience reviewing the grant application of other scientists via her service on NIH study sections and other review panels, and she has been elected to various positions in scientific societies. In addition to her teaching and research, she is a powerful advocate for women in science and has fought to promote gender equity in the sciences. Professor Gordon will discuss her career path and how her experience led to her current activism and founding of Below the Waterline, an organization devoted to supporting targets of gender harassment in, in academia. Today, her topic is, if I'm not safe, no body is science, power, and activism in the age of hashtag me too. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gordon. Well, thank, thank you so much. It is truly an honor to be here today. So uh, thank you, Andrew, for uh, bringing me. And I have to use a microphone. For bringing me and my family here today. <laughs> um, this is really, yeah, I would like, is, if I can use the cord. Excellent. Now I can, yeah. uh, th this is where my career as a scientist began. And so in, in today's talk, um, which is inspired by uh, many, many mentors that I've had starting here at Brown, and including Anita Zimmerman and Don Jackson, who are in the audience. Um, I'll tell you about how I got to where I am. Um, as Andrew said, I'm an ion channel physiologist, but I'm not going to talk to you about that today. Sigh of relief. <laughs> <laughs> e even though ion channels are, are, are what I do in my lab, instead I'm going to talk to you about what I think might be the most important work of, of my life, which is advocating for women and other marginalized groups in science. So this is Brown, so you know, for, forgive me for this next statement, but I might be one of the most intelligent and accomplished people that you will ever meet. And I thought growing up that that would keep me safe. I had thought that my intelligence and my accomplishments would shield me as a woman in, in this world. Now, I really never have felt safe. Even growing up as a small child, uh, I heard a lot of discussion about women. Um, even before Hillary Clinton, I, I grew up in Chicago, and when Jane Byrne was elected mayor in 1979, I heard my dad refer to her as that woman. Who does that woman think she is? 
At the dinner table, my very loving parents, who I know cared about me a lot, would feed my brother first. He would get the first choice of food. There is nothing that is a stronger message to people of their importance than feeding them. And I grew up, you know, I was a teenager in the 1980s. The 1980s were the decade of Andrew Dice Clay, who was the first stand-up comic to sell out Madison Square Gardens two nights in a row, based on homophobic, misogynistic comedy. And if you watch the video of those performances today, you see the audience laughing, laughing at jokes about violence toward women. I didn't feel safe in graduate school. When I would go to conferences, I was the target of an attempted sexual assault. Even here on campus, dirty jokes were considered the norm. And I, I didn't know that they were sexual harassment. I just thought, well, you know, that, that's somebody's sense of humor. But I didn't feel safe. I didn't feel safe as a postdoc when one of my fellow postdocs exposed himself to me and would come up behind me and lift me off the ground. And I told my advisor about this. Neither one of us knew to label that as sexual harassment, and so nothing was done about it. But I did think that once I became faculty that I would be safe. I thought that my intelligence and my accomplishments would shield me, would put me off limits for that kind of denigrating behavior in part because I thought that sexual harassment was about sex, and it's not. As I'll tell you in a little while, it's about power. So I got to be an assistant professor, and I was in a small department, and one of the other faculty in, in the department used to follow me around and ask, can I be your boyfriend? And again, I'd go to conferences and get aggressive behavior, and then I became an associate professor, and even in my late 30s and early 40s, I would make appointments to meet with people at conferences. They'd be standing at the side of the room. I'd walk up straight to them. They'd look around like this, like, where's this person I'm supposed to meet? And when I introduced myself, they would say, oh, oh, that's not what I expected. I didn't expect an editor to look like you. Whose lab are you in? So, the behaviors shifted from the more physically aggressive, but even in the editorial board for the journal that I am editor-in-chief of, I've had a man ask if he could sit on my lap. It doesn't stop. I've never felt safe. And I did think that I would feel safe. Growing up, I, I thought of the story of Lady Godiva. So Lady Godiva is probably an ahistorical figure, a noble woman from 13th century Cornwall. And Lady Godiva cared about the townspeople. But her husband was taxing them mercilessly. They didn't have enough food to eat, and she begged and she pleaded, please stop oppressing the people, give them a break. And finally, to shut her up, he said, well, OK. I'll, I'll pull back, I won't tax them so much, if you will strip naked and ride through town on horseback. And Lady Godiva, she did that. But she had this long, flowing hair that covered her nakedness. And I thought, you know what, maybe my accomplishments could be that for me. And so I worked and I worked. I worked so hard because I thought that if people see what I can do, then they will stop putting me down. But it turns out that because sexual harassment is not about sex, it's about power. The more power you have, the bigger a target you are. So just last summer, I was at a conference, and the keynote speaker, one of my scientific heroes, came up to me and said, you know, Sharona, when you were first appointed editor-in-chief of the Journal of General Physiology, I thought it was a mistake. I thought, she's not going to do a good job, maybe because she's a woman. But I want you to know I was wrong, and you're, what you're doing is fantastic. And as strong as I am, I went back to the hotel room and cried. And throughout the rest of the conference, I did not feel welcome. I felt like an outsider. Even though I was arguably the most powerful woman there, I felt like an outsider. 
And it got me thinking, well, why aren't my accomplishments shielding me? And so I thought back to Lady Godiva's story, and I realized that it wasn't her hair that saved her. She was willing to sacrifice the dignity of her body to make other people's lives better, and it was the righteousness of that act that really protected her. And so that got me thinking that if someone like me, who is a full professor in the best, together with Brown, <laughs> physiology department in the country isn't safe from that kind of behavior, then nobody is safe. And if I can't do something about it with all of the privilege that I have, then I shouldn't expect to be. And so it's really become my mission to make science safe for women, to make science safe for people of color, to make science safe for people with disabilities, for anyone who feels like an outsider. So I was given a weapon to do this last summer. In 2018, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine came out with a report on sexual harassment of women. And the subtitle of the report was Climate, Culture, and Consequences in Academic Sciences, Engineering, and, and Medicine. And so what I'll be telling you about today is my take on this report, is my take on how this report empowers each and every one of us to do something. So my hope is that by the time you leave this room today, that you will feel empowered, that you won't have to wait for a gift from above to fix our culture, but that you will feel like you can do it too. So I'm a teacher, I'm a professor, but what I really like to do most is learn. Learning is just my favorite thing in the world. So I'm gonna to talk to you for maybe 25, 30 minutes or so, and then I hope we have a little bit of time for a discussion. Because when I do a presentation, the best part of it for me is learning from you how what I talk about make sense or doesn't make sense in your own lives and ideas that you may have of how we can move forward together. So on the screen is the central metaphor from the National Academy's report on sexual harassment. I'll talk a lot more about this. But it says that sexual harassment is like an iceberg. An iceberg has about 10% of its mass above the waterline for everyone to see, but 90% of the mass is hidden below the waterline. So my experience as a woman in science and my realization that it's up to me, it's up to us to do something about it, prompted me to found this organization below the waterline. Everything that I talk about in all my slides are on my website, belowthewaterline.org. And I also hope that anyone who's interested will go and read this report, can look at the other materials on my website, and can feel empowered to go out there and talk to other people about it as well. So my thesis is that sexual harassment originates in bullying. And you might think that, it, that everyone will agree that bullying is bad. You might think that everyone will agree that sexual harassment is bad. But in fact, that's not the case. There are many powerful people who stand against this movement. I'll highlight one of them. So the National Academies of Sciences is perhaps the premier membership organization honoring scientists in this country. It is 82% male with an average age of 79. And yet, these are the people who advise our government on science policy. These are the people who lead review panels for funding. These are people who help shape the direction of science research in this country. So they, right now, have no policy that says if someone is a proven sexual harasser, that they should lose their membership. And so because of the brave action of a very amazing woman, Beth Ann McLaughlin at Vanderbilt, she started a petition, got over 5,000 signatures, 
and got the National Academies to propose a policy change that would allow them to kick out members who've been found responsible for sexual harassment at their institution. So they're voting on that right now. And many of their members are, are great people. It's a, it's a good step forward. But many of their members feel like this one, from Bob Weinberg at MIT, who's a member of the National Academies. And this quote comes from the journal Science, from Science Magazine. He says, before there's a mad rush to approve such an ejection procedure from the National Academies, it might be useful to ask whether sexual harassment by a member has anything whatsoever to do with their credibility as a scientist and the soundness of their research accomplishments, the criteria that were used to elect them in the first place. <coughs> and this is not an outsider voice. This is a famous professor at MIT, a member of the National Academy, who has won all of those awards. This is an influential voice. And so it makes sense, well, let's really consider, let's consider the arguments. Now, I might not have to convince you that sexual harassment hurts people. I think that's pretty obvious. But the question is, should we disregard the human beings who hurt other people? Should we kick them out of the academy and say they're not worthy? So what it comes down to is how do we compare the value of someone's work to the integrity of the scientific establishment? So let's pick an accomplishment that all of us agree is correct and that all of us can agree is a great accomplishment that has driven science forward. And that's the solving of the structure of DNA, identifying it as a double helix by Watson and Crick. This was an accomplishment that wasn't based on their own data. It was based on data that they stole from a woman, from Rosalind Franklin, with whom they worked. And yet, knowing that DNA is a double helical structure has really made a big difference. So shouldn't we continue to honor Watson and Crick? Well, we can use their own words to help us figure that out. In his book, The Double Helix, Watson wrote, Clearly, Rosie, Rosie was a nickname for Rosalind Franklin that she hated. And so, of course, that's what he used throughout his entire book. Clearly, Rosie had to go or be put in her place. The thought could not be avoided that the best home for a feminist was in another person's lab. Now, Watson's famous for being a racist. He's famous for being a misogynist. But Francis Crick is, is somewhat more highly regarded, but even he, was not a good guy. He said, I'm afraid we always used to adopt, let's say, a patronizing attitude towards her, talking about Rosalind Franklin. And Nancy Hopkins is a, a contemporary scientist, a famous scientist at MIT, who trained with Watson at Harvard. And she said recently, when I was an undergraduate at Harvard, I was sitting at my lab desk one day writing up notes when the door of the lab flew open. There stood a scientist I didn't know but recognized instantly. Before I could rise and shake hands, he had zoomed across the room, stood behind me, put his hands on my breasts, and said, what are you working on? It was Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of the structure of DNA. If Watson and Crick hadn't made their discovery, someone else would have. None of us in science is unique. We all stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. All of our findings are built on those of others. And all of those findings could be made by others. And so while it's true that identifying the structure of DNA as a double helix is a major accomplishment, if Watson and Crick hadn't done it, somebody else would have shortly thereafter. So how do you compare their accomplishment, which would have happened anyway, with the untold number of accomplishments that we've lost by women and people of color who they drove out of science. We will never know what that loss is. And so even though there are many people in the mainstream who say that sexual harassment should not be part of the evaluation process for scientists, I believe it's absolutely critical if we care about the integrity of our research 
to make sure that our conduct is consistent with our shared community values. So the National Academies report offers us some definitions that I think are useful for different kinds of sexual harassment. So there are two kinds of sexual harassment above the waterline. There's sexual coercion when favorable professional or educational treatment is conditioned on uh, sexual activity. And unwanted sexual attention, unwelcome verbal or physical sexual advances, which can include assault. Those are the behaviors that all of us would label as sexual harassment, right? Those are the Harvey Weinstein kind of casting couch, casting, casting couch behaviors. <laughs> but that's only 10% of the incidence of sexual harassment. 90%, virtually all of it, is something called gender harassment, which is defined as verbal and nonverbal behaviors that convey hostility, objectification, exclusion, or second-class status about members of one gender. 90% is gender harassment. That's my scientific hero telling me that he didn't think I would do a good job, maybe because I was a woman. That's making derogatory comments about working mothers. That's saying to a man, oh, you can't lift that up, are you a sissy? That's making comments about someone whose choices aren't our own, who doesn't look like us someone that we want to put down. And in that way, it is absolutely not about sex. It's about power. It's bullying. So the above the waterline behaviors are thought of as come-ons, and the below the waterline behaviors can be thought of as put-downs. Even the come-on behaviors are typically not about attraction. They're typically motivated by the desire to devalue women or punish those who violate gender norms. So is it important that we label below the waterline gender harassment as sexual harassment? Absolutely, what the research shows is that people who are targets of gender harassment and don't know to label it as such have more serious negative physical and mental health consequences. Gender harassment hurts people. When pervasive and persistent, it can cause just as much harm to women as above the waterline forms of harassment. So it is very serious to address. So advancing through my career, I didn't feel safe. But when I would talk to my friends and colleagues about it, we would say, well, you know, shucks. If we were in finance, or in law, we would face the same kinds of behaviors. This isn't unique to academia. It's probably no worse than it is in any other field. The new National Academy report tells us that's wrong. They compared the prevalence of sexual harassment in the academic sciences, engineering, and medicine to public sector workplaces, private sector workplaces, and government workplaces. And they found that academia is absolutely the very, very worst, second only to the military. Sexual harassment is more prevalent in the academic sciences than any other place except for the military. So this pie chart shows the percentage of women who've been recently sexually harassed in the academic sciences. And what you can pay attention to is the light blue at 37%. That's the percentage of us who haven't been harassed. Nearly two-thirds of women regularly experience either gender harassment or above the waterline forms of harassment. It is more prevalent in the academy than any public sector, private sector, or government workplace except for the military. But it turns out that that comparison to the military is useful because it allows us to ask what is it that we have in common with the military. The number one thing are hierarchical power structures. Those hierarchical power structures facilitate the kind of bullying, abusive behavior that's common to gender harassment, racism, ableism, and any other kind of oppression of a people. The other thing about the academy is that we tend to work in isolated work groups. What that means is that if someone experiences harassing behavior, 
First of all, they might not know any other kind of behavior. They might not recognize that it's toxic. And even if they do, they might not know who to go to talk to about it. There is a perceived tolerance of sexual harassment in academia that allows people to think they can get away with it, that correctly allows people to think they can get away with it. Another one that we'll talk about more in a minute are policies focused on protecting institutions from legal liability. This next one, these, this is a quote from the National Academy Report. These aren't my words. Uninformed, unfocused, and uncommitted academic <coughs> leaders. And then finally, the low representation of women in the academic sciences, particularly in leadership positions. So let's talk about this legalistic approach. So the legalistic approach, primarily through Title IX offices, has often meant that we have symbolic compliance instead of actually trying to help targets of harassment. And what that means is that 90% of women, 90% do not report sexual harassment because of the well-founded fear of retaliation. And that allows institutions to say, we don't have a problem. People aren't reporting that there's a problem. And so it's really self-perpetuating. That legalistic approach allows us to claim we don't have a problem, and it allows us to focus on liability instead of actually helping people. The other thing is that the legal bar is much too low. Much of what happens in gender harassment, which remember is 90% of sexual harassment, doesn't meet the standard for being illegal. But just because it isn't illegal doesn't mean that it's right and doesn't mean that we should tolerate it. So it's also very useful to think of sexual harassment, gender harassment in particular, as a kind of bullying, because there's a lot of research that's been done on bullying. It's often termed incivility, which I know is a term that can be used and has been used to silence the voices of oppressed people. But here, incivility is defined in the report as low intensity deviant behavior with ambiguous intent to harm the target in violation of workplace norms for mutual respect. So the underlining there is mine, because I want to point out that there, this is where I don't agree with the National Academy's report. If gender harassment is happening to most women most of the time, then it's not in violation of workplace norms. It exactly meets the workplace norms. These are the social norms we've set in the workplace that this is OK. And what the research also shows is that it doesn't exist in a vacuum. Workplaces that have one kind of bullying typically have other kinds of bullying as well. <laughs> Workplaces that are rife with incivility, not valuing people, treating people disrespectfully, those are the kinds of environments in which you have a lot of gender harassment. And the above the waterline forms of sexual harassment don't occur in isolation either. Workplaces that are high in the incidence of gender harassment also are high in the incidence of above the waterline harassment. So the report, it's a 300 page report. It has a lot of stuff in it. It's, it's really quite disturbing, but I view it as incredibly optimistic because what it says is that our behavior generates an ambient signal. In the case of incivility and disrespect, it's an ambient signal that's like toxic secondhand smoke. That even one person who's showing that disrespectful behavior and modeling it for others can spread disrespectful behavior and harassment to others. But on the flip side, one person who models respectful behavior, who shows that they value other people, also generates an ambient signal. I call it aromatherapy. <laughs> <laughs> and that signal also spreads. So even, even if you are just a little bit kinder, show a little bit more respect every day to those around you, you are doing something not only that makes a difference in that one situation, but you're generating a signal that travels and amplifies. So that's where we get back to the iceberg metaphor. So many of us in the academy, we're focused on our research, we're focused on our teaching, we're focused on our local service, 
of keeping the trains running on time. And we're hoping that our academic leaders help us by identifying solutions. And boy, I want the academic leaders to identify and implement solutions to above the waterline harassment. As a rank and file faculty member, I don't want to be responsible for adjudicating that kind of behavior, for identifying equitable punishments, for figuring out how to rehabilitate people. I want the leaders to develop good policies and to enforce them. But what can our academic leaders even really do about below the waterline forms of harassment? What can they really do about the small comments that we make to each other every single day? How would they do it? I would argue they can support us in our efforts, but that changing our academic culture really requires a bottom-up approach. So why is it that we have sexual harassment? We know that if we have incivility, then we get gender harassment. And if we have gender harassment, then we get above the waterline harassment. But what's the root cause for all of these? The root cause is our climate and culture the same way that the freezing water is the root cause of the iceberg. If the water is freezing, you can take an ax and hack off bits of ice. With sexual harassment, that would mean something like bystander training. Every time you see someone do something rude, every time you see someone do something callous, go up, interrupt, and tell them, don't do that. That's not OK. That's treating the symptoms. I'm not saying it isn't important. But the root cause of harassment is the temperature of the water. In the case of the iceberg, you can hack off, play whack-a-mole with it as much as you like. The water's just going to refreeze so long as the temperature is really, really cold. So what we need to do in our culture is find a way to warm the water. So what sets the temperature of the water? What is the water? The answer to that question is so empowering. That water is our community. And what sets its temperature is the interactions each and every one of us have with each other every single day. That means that if I talk to 20 people every day, those are 20 opportunities to warm the temperature of the water. Those are 20 opportunities to let someone know that I value them in their entirety. So valuing people in their entirety is so important. When I was an assistant professor, I was told by my colleagues, don't put up pictures of your children in your office. I now have four, but then I only had two, only two. And I was told, if you have pictures of your kids in your office, then when people will come to see you in that professional environment, they'll see your kids, and they might assume that you aren't committed to your career. They might not ask you to be involved in things that happen on the weekends or in the evenings. So just put those pictures in a drawer. We now know that there's a word for that. It's called code switching, asking someone to leave part of their identity at the door when they come into work. And what we've learned from social sciences is that code switching hurts people. And so we need to show people that they are welcome in their entirety in the workplace. We need to find the opportunities to do that to warm the temperature of the water. There's another benefit to this metaphor, which is that it allows us to bring more people into the conversation. I spent many years talking about sexual harassment. And what I found is that when I talked to some people, particularly but not exclusively men, that the men would get defensive in the conversations. And they would feel blamed. And you know what? That's because I was using blaming language. But this report gives us a new language. By seeing that the incidents of sexual harassment are natural consequences of being in the cold water, we can shift the conversation away from blame and toward a shared responsibility moving forward. These are just symptoms. We don't get mad at people when they have a fever. 
we give them an aspirin and an antibiotic. And so recognizing that for the 90% of incidents that are gender harassment, that all of us do it because we are socialized to have a view of women as second class citizens allows us to enfranchise a much larger number of people, including men, into the conversation to talk about how we can work together. So, like I said earlier, I used to think, like other faculty, that I needed to wait for my academic leaders to help solve this problem. I'm done waiting. I'm done waiting not only because I'm sick of it, but because the National Academy report gives me a mandate to do something. The report makes 15 recommendations. 14 of them are high level, talking about what institutions can do, what professional societies can do. But one of them, recommendation 15, says make the entire academic community responsible for reducing and preventing sexual harassment. That's me. I'm responsible. The professor in the lab next door is responsible. The staff in the office are responsible. The students are responsible. Each and every one of us is responsible for setting the temperature of that water that is our environment, and we are all told that we should do so. So how do we do it? We do it by focusing on the, on the water, by focusing on the community. The water is our community. By building the community, by making the community stronger, by giving our more opportunities to interact, we increase the temperature of the water. So increasing the temperature of the water to build community, I would argue, is critical not just for reducing sexual harassment, but for reducing many other kinds of bullying. It allows us opportunities to model professional, respectful behavior, to show that we value individuals, to recognize a healthy versus toxic culture, to share best practices, and to stand in solidarity with people who are targets of harassment and let them know that what they've experienced does not conform to our shared values as a community. So I founded this organization, Below the Waterline, to fulfill that mandate. I thought, you know, what are, what are the things that I'm good at? How can I contribute? One of them is by hosting discussions, both on my own campus and across the country to talk about different views on below the waterline harassment and what we can do about it, by teaching departments how to set a welcoming and inclusive atmosphere. I've also started a peer supporter program. When a student at my university experiences some form of gender harassment and they go to one of our authority figures, that authority is not allowed to say, I believe you. But peers can. Peers don't have to be neutral. So peer supporters stand in solidarity with targets of harassment so that they don't have to be isolated and they don't have to be alone. I also started a faculty allies program by which faculty volunteers can lend their institutional knowledge to help people who maybe need to you know, get mentoring, can't get it through the traditional way. Well, how can we identify approaches to go around that, to find other ways to meet students' needs. And also by hosting community restoration circles, which use the principles of restorative justice to heal communities. Because sexual harassment doesn't have one perpetrator and one target. Each and every one of us is a perpetrator. And each and every one of us is a target because we have all been socialized to think of women as second class. So, I want to go to question and answers, but I want to leave you with just one quote from the report that is meaningful to me. Placing responsibility and control for sexual harassment planning and response at the highest administrative levels guided by attorneys would likely produce a different organizational culture and climate than when guided by faculty, students, and service providers. In other words, if we don't follow this mandate, if we don't take up the cause for positive culture change, then we might not like the one that we're handed from above. So it's on us. 
So with that, I want to thank all of you for listening and take any questions or comments that you might have. Thank you. Yes, please. No, it, it, it's everywhere. But I, I believe that almost everyone in the academy wants to do better. If only we can find a language to allow that to happen. I'm not saying that particular man, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, I, um, I hope you don't mind. I, I took photographs of your slides. Sure. There. So much you, you can also download them from my website. Oh, I was thinking, yeah. too, there's a website right there. So I was yeah. hoping it was public. But I didn't yeah. want to it, it's bother you about this. But yeah. have you done a TED Talk? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Please get it on your agenda. OK. okay. All right, I saw another question there. Yes. Well, I'm not going to take credit for that myself. I mean, there are people in the graduate school that we all work together and think very carefully about how we use language and who we speak to. So, but the credit is not mine alone. It's a group of people. So, uh, I actually have a question. Can yeah. I? <laughs> so, uh, I noticed in your slide you showed that 37% of women uh, reported not being harassed. I guess I was struck by that number because I don't know. It seemed, seemed large to me. And I'm, I, I, I assume that when that survey was done, maybe the question was over the last 10 years or 20 years, I guess I would imagine over the lifespan that number of, the number of people reporting not being harassed would go down. So I was wondering if you might be able to qualify what that survey was. Over what period of time did you ask? So that survey was uh, done at uh, Penn State and University of Texas over, over asking about experiences over a two-year period. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, it's, it, is, it is shocking. Uh, when we start to pay attention to gender harassment, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And not just by men. I do it. I have to say, I've been socialized the same way everybody else have, has, and you know, Luckily, sometime in my 20s, I learned to put in a filter between my brain and my mouth. <laughs> <laughs>
because I, I have gender harassing thoughts just like anybody, but I'm learning to recognize them and I know that they don't reflect my core values. Yes, there's a question in the back. Yeah, when I talk to audiences that are all faculty, I tell them that hazing is not an effective pedagogical method. <laughs> and yet, that is how we are trained to educate. That is how we are trained to interact with each other. So it does it. It requires a large scale cultural shift, but every one of us has power to contribute to that shift. Problem and, and what the academies have produced. And I'm curious if you would share a little bit about how you thought about your role in this, because it seems like you've given a lot of that to your experience and where you can be effective. And you talked about uh, changing norms and also a little bit about changing power structures directly. So can you talk about how you decided to go in this direction as opposed to, say, changing the entire structure of your lab and asking your department to change how they do mentorship? I just graduated from the STEM PhD myself, so this is like, here's what this to you. Yeah, oh, that, that's a good question, and it's one that I continue to struggle with. Where can I be most effective? So I've been going out and giving talks like this in the community. And what I found is that other faculty can, can get it. They understand that we're the ones who are responsible, but that a lot of the junior people have a really hard time with that because right now they are in toxic environments. Right now they are in pain. And so I feel called to address that. And so that's where the peer supporter, faculty, ally, and community restoration circles come from, that at least within my local sphere, I can try to alleviate some of that. Um, but I'm also working at the institutional level uh, and working at the national level. Um, but for me, the framework of focusing on the below the waterline stuff is really liberating because when you're talking about the illegal forms of sexual harassment, there's a lot of balkanization and territorialism in the academy that makes it difficult to uh, really work as a team with everyone. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. So there are quite a few factors that we have in common, some of them with the military, um, that make us more susceptible to sexual harassment. So hierarchical power structures, isolation within labs. And the National Academies report has 14 other recommendations that I didn't talk about. And some of them are about diffusing the hierarchical power structures and other institutional level changes that, that can be made. Uh, I'm just focusing on the grassroots level because I don't have to wait for the glacial pace of change that
that happens at the institutional or national level to do something. 